Greetings and welcome as we worship the living God at St. John's Baptist Church of Charlotte, North Carolina. This is the first Sunday during Lent, a season of 40 days, not including Sundays, in the Christian calendar, challenging us to spiritual preparation for our celebration of the resurrection of Jesus at Easter's dawn. The word Lent stems from the Latin word lengthen, meaning lengthen. As the days of spring lengthen, providing more light each day, Lent increases the penetration of God's light into our lives. As we confess our sins to God, repent of our ways of darkness, and turn away from thoughts of self-centeredness to make earth more heavenly. During our worship in this season of Lent, we will consider the spiritual life of Jesus. After all, Jesus is Lord of our active faith. Jesus invited us to come to him, to learn of him by taking his yoke of discipleship upon our lives. Jesus commissioned us to obey everything he taught. We only become more mature humans as we grow to be more like Jesus. For the next six Sundays, we will allow the spiritual life of Jesus to guide us in our worship. Next Sunday, on February 28th, I will consider Jesus' spirit-empowered life. On March 7th, I will look at how Jesus pursued virtue. On March 14th, I will offer a message on Jesus and compassionate justice. On March 21st, I will speak about Jesus' public witness and influence. And on Palm Sunday, March 28th, I will present a message on how Jesus guides us to live prayerfully. Today, on this first Sunday during Lent, we worship the living God who guides us through the written word. My message will remind you how Jesus made use of the scriptures and how we should do the same. Yes, how firm a foundation, you saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in his excellent word. Let us worship the living God.
Today's scripture is Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he was famished. The tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, One does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. And Jesus said to him, Again it is written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to him, And these I will give to you, if you will fall down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil left him, and suddenly angels came and waited on him. This is the written word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Lord, who throughout these forty days for us did fast and pray, teach us to overcome our sins and close by you to stay. As you Let us pray. Ever-present Lord, faithful to speak, grant us the will to hear your voice. May we learn to be still and to listen. For this is what Jesus did for 40 days at the outset of his ministry and at various times on each and every day he was still and listened for your voice. And each of us should not pretend that we know what is right and that we know how to act when we have not allowed you to speak to us. And though it's harder at sometimes, help us to always have ears that are inclined to hear your voice. We confess to you that we can become slaves to our impulses, feeding and justifying our anger, nursing our grievances, holding on to our pain like it's something precious, enjoying the downfall of others, refusing to see the humanity of those that we disagree with, elevating ourselves however and wherever we can, and just taking whatever we can get for ourselves. And all the while, finding a way to justify our behavior. Lord, we know we will all struggle with temptation, for even Jesus did. But help us to never call the evil good, and to never pretend that our own selfish ends are good. So as Jesus turned to you, we do likewise. And now for a few moments, let each of us individually confess to you the temptations and struggles that we're dealing with in our own lives and to listen for your voice and what it might say to us.
And now we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Gracious Spirit, dwell with me. I would gracious be. Help me now thy grace to see. I would be like thee. And with words that help and heal thy life would mine reveal. And with actions bold and meek for Christ my Savior speak. As we enter this season of Lent, we approach the living God with a sincere desire to renew our commitments as followers of Jesus. Lord, hear our prayer. We confess that we fail to look at our imperfections as we focus on the imperfections of others. Forgive us for seeing the speck in our neighbor's eye while refusing to acknowledge the beam in our own. Shape us by your spirit so our sincere intentions motivate us to Christ-like actions. As we follow Jesus, our spiritual life is shaped by Jesus' spiritual life. Lord, hear our prayer. Teach us how to mature in self-awareness as we give attention to your spirit speaking to our hearts. As we follow Jesus, he is Lord of our active faith. Lord, hear our prayer. Renew us to your vision for our individual lives and our life together as a community of disciples. Where we are corrupt, purify us. Where we have lost our way, direct us. Where we are being actively faithful, strengthen us. Where we have need of insight or clarity, provide for us. Where we are divided, give us the courage and humility to seek your heart as we follow the path of Jesus. Amen. Amen.
She was the type of person who never asked for enlightenment. She only asked for affirmation. She was always convinced that she was right or on the right path, even when she was wrong or searching along the wrong path. So when she came to me with her question about the Bible, I knew that to offer the help she needed would frustrate both of us. This was her question. Where is the verse in Proverbs that says, a rolling stone gathers no moss? Now, just between us, that saying is not in Proverbs. It is nowhere in the other 65 books of the Bible either. But she would have never believed me, and an argument would have ensued. So I said to her, well, if you come across the proverb, a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush, you'll find that other one. Well, of course, neither phrase is in the Bible. When Jay Leno was host of The Tonight Show, he decided to test his audience's Bible knowledge. He asked them to name one of the Ten Commandments. Quickly, a hand shot up from the crowd and a person shouted, God helps those who help themselves. The audience laughed because most of them knew this was not one of the Ten Commandments. However, over the next couple of minutes, the only commandment they could name was, Thou shall not kill. Well, this past week, professional baseball players started reporting for spring training. A few years ago, during spring training, a baseball coach watched an experienced infielder allow four ground balls to go through his legs. The coach shouted, you've got to get down lower to block those grounders. The player said, I know that. I don't need you to tell me. And the coach replied, I know that you know it, but that's not why I told you. Well, friends of God, you know the Bible is an important book for your life of faith. You, you don't need me to tell you that you should follow Jesus in living a scripture-informed life. However, as a coach in this faith community, I do notice some grounders going through the legs now and then. So let's be honest. Most of you know more Bible than you're living now. So let's enter spring training and brush up on doing what you know. This next week, I will be posting some information on our staff blog uh, to help you in reading and using the Bible in your spiritual journey. We should never deny how the Bible has been abused over time. The Bible has been misused by those who are power hungry, those who are filled with hatred, those who are unloving, and those who are too lazy to learn how to read spiritually inspired literature. Historic damage has been caused century after century when the Bible has been abused to create scripturally deformed living, burning of heretics, the Crusades, slavery, apartheid, oppression of native peoples, and much additional pain all defended through the misuse of select scripture quotes, misquotes, interpretations, and applications out of context. Now, still today, the people abuse and misuse the Bible, supporting their own selfish motives and biases. We know this. But one reason people do not live scripture-informed lives is that they find the Bible confusing. They decry the Bible to be nothing more than antique words written hundreds and thousands of years ago by people and for people who thought the earth was flat. The languages and cultures were extremely different from today, and for many people, the Bible seems out of touch with this postmodern scientific world. Now, I don't mean to discount or devalue that perspective, yet I offer another point of view. When read and interpreted appropriately, not legalisti legalistically or with bias, the Bible speaks more to those human characteristics and challenges which transcend time and space, culture and societies. The Bible helps you understand the character of God, the nature of humanity and the vision of God for humanity. The Bible offers words of comfort and hope, vision and peace and insight. These words speak to the deepest longings and desires and needs of human life. The Bible offers thoughts that would never occur to you otherwise. I encourage you to use the Bible as a sort of GPS for the direction of your life. The Bible is not God, nor does the Bible confine God's revelation to these written words. However, 
your joy, your contentment, your understanding, balance, confidence, and maturity as a child of God and a follower of Jesus will increase in spiritual breadth and depth as you pursue a scripture-informed life. But please listen to me now. If you grew up in a tradition that did not teach the Bible much, or if your participation was sporadic, so you didn't learn much about the Bible, please do not be ashamed. If you grew up in a tradition that always used the Bible as a book of hate, and bias, and prejudice, and judgment, ridicule, or legalism, please do not be angry. And if you grew up in a tradition where people fought over the Bible as to whether it was inerrant or inspired, please do not be afraid. The Bible is still here to inform you, playing its tune so God can transform your spirit. On the first Sunday during Lent, we once again consider this story of Jesus being driven into the wilderness where he is tempted by Satan. Dr. Ronald Siegel, a professor of psychopharmacology, identifies a fourth instinctual drive in the human psyche. Usually, we think of people being driven by personal ambition or power or material aggrandizement. Siegel, though, suggests there is a fourth instinctual drive and that it is the most subtle of all, the drive toward God the desire to fulfill our spiritual reason for being. Matthew and other writers of biblical literature name this drive to be God's Holy Spirit. Jesus is thrown, tossed, you could say, into physical and spiritual space where he can do nothing except pay attention to his inner wilderness and to do his soul work. Now you may know that the Hebrew word for Satan or Satan derives from the Hebrew common noun suggesting a constriction of flow, an obstruction of movement, a choked or blocked circulation of energy. In other words, Satan, the evil one, is that which blocks the energy of God's spirit from shaping or forming you into what God desires for you to become or be, or do. Jesus is tempted to do something other than or less than what God has set before him as his mission in life. This is the temptation you face as well. Can you feel the small granules of wilderness sand in your spirit? Are you aware of the desolation that comes with the grit in the wind as you're alone in the presence of the living God? When you sit still, when you turn off the devices and the screens, when you take time to be holy by simply being in the presence of the holy other, do you also notice how temptations arise within you? The English artist Stanley Spencer painted a wilderness series about the life of Christ. And in one of the paintings, he depicts Jesus sitting on the desert sand with a wild beast. However, the beast in this painting is not a roaring lion or a serpent. He shows Jesus holding in his hands a small but deadly scorpion. It is as if the artist is suggesting that the dangerous beasts are the small ones that can slither into our lives almost unnoticed. Those temptations of persistent sin bargains for which we trade that appear to be small infidelities, but they carry a paralyzing venom into our discipleship. I think it is significant that Jesus responds to each temptation with these words, it is written. The only way Jesus would have known what was written in the scriptures is that he had read and studied what those scriptures meant. Each temptation was an abuse of scripture, but Jesus lived a scripture-informed life. Beloved, as followers of Jesus, we must also be found guilty of pursuing a scripture-informed life. Has it ever occurred to you that the ministry of Jesus would not have been possible had he not first gone into the wilderness? 
And has it occurred to you that Jesus would not have survived the wilderness temptations faithfully had he not already been pursuing a scripture-informed life? Even in Jesus' study of scripture and in his wilderness temptations, God was at work remaking the world. You know, this past week I noticed all the barren trees in our city. Only a short season ago they were green and full of bounty. What I cannot see in this season is what is taking place underground, out of sight, the enriching and renewing of the roots, the deepening of the roots into the nutrients of the soil. And in time, during this season of Lent, in fact, we will begin to see buds and blooms. We will begin to see new life. And so it goes. During this season of Lent, we are tending to our soul work. We are deepening our spiritual roots so that the breadth and the growth of new life can occur in seasons to come. Amen and amen. In the year 1503, Martin Luther was 20 years of age and halfway through his studies at the University of Erfurt. He was browsing in the library and he came across a copy of the scriptures. This experience left a deep impression upon his life for two reasons. First, this was the first time Martin Luther had ever laid his hands on a complete copy of the Bible. And the second reason for the deep impression on his life was the fact that the Bible was chained. The Bible was not to be taken from that spot. He looked back on that moment in his life many times. He wanted to somehow allow the scriptures to become unchained in the lives of God's people. No other person probably in human history has done more to set the Bible free so that people can have scripture-informed life. Beloved, during this season of Lent, let us renew ourselves to setting the message of the Bible free within us, among us, and through us in the life of the world. Shalom.
Thank you.